So what would you say to somebody that's that would say that these products have essentially created a paper market for Bitcoin and has actually degraded the trust in the system to a current degree, despite the price action and the and the and what we're seeing as far as value creation. So 15, 16 million are basically saying I'm not selling. That's 75, 80 percent. So that begs the question. Uh, if people are looking at this and have been following this space for such a long period of time and are nowhere near the point of saying, I'm going to cash in, we don't know what the upside potential is, but what is the upside potential? Like you, you've kind of hinted in the past where this could go in years to come, but that, that's, that's a big nut, 75, 80% when people aren't selling, making it extremely difficult for companies like BlackRock to actually purchase anything. Hey everyone, thanks for checking into our latest Trade of Black podcast. We've had a lot of feedback recently about forget cannabis stocks, let's focus on crypto and why not Bitcoin reaching an all time high. What's the upside of that? Well, that's what we want to focus on right now in today's podcast as we welcome in one of the best thought leaders in crypto, in Bitcoin, and for that matter, business economics. We welcome back a friend of the podcast, Mark Yusko, CEO of Morgan Creek Digital. Good to see you. Uh, Lee, we're already yeah, great to be with y'all. Yeah, exactly. But look, we had you on about 60 days ago and we said this is a monumental year for the crypto industry and more specifically Bitcoin. We look at this 60 days in now here in 2024. Do you think this has met all expectations or even exceeded them knowing that we've already reached an all time high for Bitcoin? Uh, so, yes, is the short answer. But, you know, I don't do short. So um, I think we absolutely have met and exceeded expectations, especially because expectations changed very dramatically right after the release of or the approval of, of the ETFs. So, you know, coming into the year, I was pretty convinced that that they were going to approve the ETFs yep. and that that was going to accelerate this slow trend toward fair value and fair value. Yeah. If you look at the Metcalf's law model, we talked about this last year, even was somewhere in the low fifties. And so by the having and the having is, you know, third week of April this year, uh, I thought we would drift, you know, from the the thirties up toward 50 and, and people would be pretty, pretty happy with that. But the accelerant to that would be yeah. the approval of each. Well, well, why is that an accelerant? Well, it's a demand shock because what, what the ETF does is it opens up the opportunity to invest in Bitcoin to a, a larger group of people. And, you know, since I am a boomer, I can say it's a boomer wrapper for those investors that they're not really comfortable negotiating online. They don't really want to carry a ledger around. They... They don't even really trust Coinbase yet. So they're like, look, if you're going to put it in something I can put in my 401k or in my Schwab account, bring it. But here was the problem is first you had to have approval, which, you know, Gary Gensler had been against until the courts kind of ruled or judge ruled against him. So he had to go ahead and, and approve it. But then there was a second leg, which we saw in the week after, and that's what I talk about expectations changed, is there were a lot of people said, oh, this is a buy the rumor, sell the news. You know, it's already priced in. And we had the move from 30 to, I think we got all the way up to 47. And yeah. we said, oh, it's gonna crash right after. And right after the approval, Vanguard, Bank of America, handful of others said, no, just because you approved it, we're still not gonna allow our clients to buy it. Now, think about what they just said. Right. They're telling us, humans, that the money that, that's ours, that we put in their company, we can't use to buy what we want. I, and know. I know you guys have experienced a lot with cannabis and, and other. It's just ridiculous. But yeah. what we forget, right, is in the trust industry, right, the entire industry of trust, banking, brokerage, insurance, all this stuff, that's the fact, right? You put your money in a bank, it's not your money. It's actually the bank's money. Look at the balance sheet. It's yeah. their money. Now we have an IOU and that IOU is good 
99.9% of the time, that 0.1%, it's a bitch. But, and, you know, Cyprus, we saw that years ago when, you know, you woke up and 75% of your money was bailed in and taken away. Or when the Hoya National Savings Bank went under, all your money, unless it was insured by FDIC, so anything over 1.25 million, gone, vaporized. So same thing with a brokerage firm. You put your money in a brokerage firm, it's now their money. The stocks that you think you own are actually in their name at DTCC. They're in the street name of UBS or Merrill Lynch. And again, you have an IOU, and it's even a little better than the IOU from a bank. A bank IOU, if they go bust, you're toast. Mm -hmm. With a brokerage firm, if they go bust, you actually are a secured creditor. You get you get to be higher in line. So it's a little bit better IOU, but still an IOU. So all of this comes to say that I think people misunderstood how important it was for them to finally relent. So in the past week, we've seen the CEO of Vanguard mysteriously retire. Maybe do you think, that, do you think yeah, that was attributable? Look, he was there 33 was years. The Maybe penis? he was planning to retire yeah. anyway, but I don't know. I, I think he made a call or someone made a call. I think they got a lot of pushback and I think they're going to change their mind. Merrill Lynch has changed their mind. UBS has yeah. changed their mind. So people are coming around. So all that said, now we've had this massive run. You know, we went from 47 all the way back. I think we hit 38 and people are like, see, I told you, sell the news. Yeah. And the stalwarts were like, that's a gift, right? Yeah. I can buy more yeah, right. at a cheaper price. Now, <laughs> if you, and, and I, don't, I don't even call myself a conspiracy theorist, but if you believe as I do, that if you're a large investor, and yep. you know that you need to buy a big old chunk of something. What is the oldest trick on Wall Street? What do you do, right? If you want to buy a lot of something, you actually sell it. You actually spread Correct. rumors that it's lousy and you push the price down. I mean, you know, Dwight Anderson used to work for Julian Robertson. He tells this story all the time. They wanted to buy a big position in copper. And he's like, all right, Julian, here's my, my report. On, on copper, let's, let's go buy it. Julian's like, yeah. are you joking? We'll sell 50 million copper. And then you tell people that we're selling copper because I want to buy more than 50 million of copper. I want to buy a lot of copper. And yeah. Soros would do the same thing. And I mean, so BlackRock knew that they were going to have to buy a bunch. Perhaps they were the ones telling people to sell. Yeah. Maybe. So, <clears throat> because do you think now- that, you think that was the message? Put, you think that was the message on Wall Street? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, look at Jamie Dimon. I mean, knew. look at Jamie Dimon. He was saying crypto was toxic. He was saying crypto had no place. Meanwhile, JP Morgan's been heavily investing in, in uh, blockchain infrastructure as well as crypto. Well, and um, they are the, yeah. um, what do they call it? The AP, the uh, something party that yeah. you have to have a legitimate entity next to your name if you wanted to get approval for the ETF. And JP Morgan was like, oh, yeah. we will be that. And so, yeah. look, I get it that the bankers don't like this technology, right? Bitcoin in particular replaces, it obviates the need for the trust industry. Right. We talked about this in past shows, right? If in the old yeah. days, if I wanted to lend you guys money, we had to have ledgers and we had to have somebody make sure that the ledgers were accurate. Yeah. That somebody was the banks for 838 years. It's a long time. They took a very nice fee for making sure that our ledgers matched mm -hmm. and we trusted them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, I, I don't know if I told the story on here, but imagine I have this recurring nightmare. I go to the ATM, I punch in my code, yeah. And it says zero. Like, yeah. how would I prove it's not zero? I don't have a statement. I haven't had a statement in 10 years. Good it's point. their word against mine, right? I'm trusting them that they didn't steal all my money. But if they wanted to, they, they could pretty easily. But with Bitcoin, I don't have to trust them anymore. If I own a Bitcoin on the network and all the nodes agree that Mark owns that Bitcoin, I am my own bank. 
So yep. I understand that the so, banks don't like it. So what would you say to somebody that's that would say that these products have essentially created a paper market for Bitcoin and has actually degraded the trust in the system to a current degree, despite the price action and the and the and what we're seeing as far as value creation? Um, for so this space. again, great great question, and and it's true. <clears throat> a year and a half ago, a year and a half yeah. ago, that's exactly what happened. Because they create GBTC. futures ETFs. Yeah. Right? A futures contract does exactly what you described. It creates a mm -hmm. paper version of a commodity. So if you think about oil, in the old days, if I wanted to sell you a barrel of oil, I actually had to have somewhere a barrel of oil that I could put on a truck or a tanker car and deliver to you on right. said date. Yeah. But then the futures markets, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange came along and said, you know what, Mark, you can just write a contract that you promise to go get somewhere a barrel of oil at a said date. Well, yeah. wait a second. If I can just write a contract and then if we, as long as we settle up the contract before I have to go get the oil, I don't have to get any oil. And so what happens yeah. is you have this massive creation of paper commodities, paper oil, paper gold, paper wheat. And so those markets tended then to be more volatile mm -hmm. and they can be manipulated. Because to your point, yeah. if I'm a big institution, okay, and I want the price to go down, let's say hypothetically, although this is not hypothetical because they got caught and they had to pay a billion dollars a billion, a billion dollars. JP Morgan paid one bit. Well, actually, it was 960 million, so it wasn't a billion. But right. let's call it a billion. Let's round to a billion. Fine for doing exactly this. They would short gold naked, which you're not supposed to be able to do, <clears throat> using future. So there was no gold involved. They were just shorting paper to push the price down because if gold prices rise, people freak out. They're like, you're devaluing yeah. my currency. They didn't want the world to know they were devaluing the currency. So as they printed more dollars, the price of the gold started to rise. Right. So then the big banks said, no, 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 no. We need to put a tamper on that gold price. It's called spoofing. And so yeah. two years ago, they got caught and they paid this fine to the SEC, 960 million. Now, the funny part was they're like, well, yeah, but we made 20 billion doing it. Right. So it's just like a cost of doing business. It's 5%. Who cares? Now, yeah. in the Bitcoin world, that happened. So if you go back to 2021, we got all the way to 68, whatever it was, 68.5, which we just beat, you know, last night. So 68.5, or maybe it was 68.3, it doesn't matter. But yeah, so yeah. we got to the, the all-time high. Literally on the day of the launch of these futures backed ETFs, the price started down and we ended up going down 74%. Now that wasn't all the banks shorting, it was people freaking out and people who had bought, you know, chasing, buying what they wish they would have bought, selling. But it, the key was the beginning of that was this paper manipulation. The difference this time, these are spot ETFs, meaning when BlackRock gets an order, yep. Or when Bitwise gets an order, Fidelity gets an order, they have to go find actual Bitcoin. Yes. They can't just buy futures contracts and pretend that they have Bitcoin. So what you're seeing in the last week is a mad scramble. Yes. Literally a mad mm. scramble for Bitcoin because in the first few days, actually first few weeks, every dollar that was coming in that BlackRock and Bitwise and Fidelity and Valkyrie had to buy, GBTC was selling because yes. they decided to keep their fee really high because this was actually reasonably smart. I don't like it, but it was reasonably smart. They're like, look, the vast majority of our investors in GBTC, the trust, bought in at much, much lower prices. So they bought in at five, eight, ten thousand dollar Bitcoin. Now we're at thirty, forty, fifty thousand. Yep. If they sell 
to avoid the high fee to go into one of the low fee products, they're going to pay taxes. Way better to just pay the one and a half percent fee and defer the taxes. So that was actually a genius move on their part to keep the money train going because DCG has its own problems and Barry, you know, is being sued by the yeah. AP and all this good stuff. But that wasn't a bad. But the people who had it in a retirement account where taxes don't matter, they're like, I'm out. I'm going to transfer to Bitwise where I can pay zero for the first six months or to BlackRock where I can pay 20, I think 30 basis points. So yeah. that every day, 200 million, 400 million, 500 million was coming out. And that was available to buy with the new inflows. Well, suddenly no one was selling GBTC and they still had to come up with, you know, on some days, 10,000 Bitcoin. There's only 900 yeah. created every day. So you had this massive supply demand imbalance. And the rumor was yesterday or the day before that the OTC desks basically they were, were dry. They just didn't have any Bitcoin to sell. I, I'm hearing Kraken. I'm hearing Kraken won't even let you leverage ETH, Solar, Bitcoin right now because they don't have the supply to actually. Yeah, to, well, to, to, to that point, out. I was on Kraken the other day and I was swapping uh, an old, I won't use the vernacular, but an old token that I thought was decent and it turned out not to be, trying to swap it into Bitcoin. And it just kept saying, not available, not available. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they don't have any, but at the price. See, that's the thing. It's not that there's no Bitcoin. There's lots of Bitcoin. You know, there's yeah. call it 15 odd million. You know, there've been 19 something million created and there's somewhere between three and 5 million that have been lost or stolen. So there's 15 or 16 million Bitcoin. So there's plenty of Bitcoin. The problem is there's a whole bunch of them, 65 odd percent that people have said, at this price, I'm not selling. I'm not selling. So, yeah, it's sitting in it's sitting in cold wallets <clears throat> off of exchanges that yeah. just and people are actually diamond handed. So like and everybody says, life. I'll never sell. But here's the thing: never is a long time. And no, that, it yeah. reminds me there was a there's this this fancy street in Chapel Hill, uh, runs down the middle of town, and it separates the town and the university called Franklin Street. And there are these old houses from the 1700s that are kind of you know nice to have. And back when I first moved here, there was this famous story about this, this billionaire who, who walked, he's walking down the street and he saw this guy out clipping his hedges. And he says, I want to buy your house. I was like, dude, this is not for sale. At the time, the house yeah. was worth, you know, 300 grand, whatever. Yep. Yeah. It was a perfectly nice little bungalow. And uh, he said, what do you mean it's not for sale? Everything's for sale. He said, well, <laughs> it's not for sale. He says, well, no, tell me how much. He said, I, I don't know. A million dollars. Guy's like, okay. And he wrote him a check. He's like, no, I told you it's not. You said a million dollars. Here's a million dollars. And and he had yeah. to sell. Now that house sells for like three million, which is ridiculous. But, yeah. Um, that got the ball crazy. rolling. Yeah. But it, it's people say I won't sell or when should I sell? Bitcoin is a savings technology. Yeah. It's a savings yeah. account. It protects your wealth from the ravages of the stealth wealth tax of inflation. So yeah. when do you cash out your savings? Not every day. You don't cash out your savings to buy coffee. You don't cash out your savings to buy a shirt. You cash out your savings when you need to make a big investment or you need to make a big purchase like college or you know you want to fund a, a year's worth of retirement. And so the way Bitcoin is going to function is People are going to move their savings into Bitcoin. Yeah. It will continue to appreciate. And I use that term lightly because Bitcoin actually doesn't appreciate. It doesn't. Yeah, the dollar. One Bitcoin dollar. is one Bitcoin. Right. And it will always be yeah. one Bitcoin. It's like one ounce of gold is always one ounce of gold. You can't change it. It doesn't get bigger. The dollar or the yen or the euro or the renminbi, you know, Bitcoin's been making new highs in foreign currencies all week. You know, first it was this currency, then it was that currency. And it finally made a new high against the euro on Saturday or Sunday. And then yesterday it made a new high against the dollar. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean Bitcoin got better. It means those currencies got worse. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Currencies kept devaluing because we're printing more of them. And because people realize this other thing, whether it's gold or silver or Bitcoin, is more scarce than these you know, profligate money spenders in, in the governments in the Western world. So, so all that comes back to say, yeah. it's going to be savings. Boomers now can transfer some of their wealth yeah. into it. I, I tell you, this was a great one. Someone tweeted this out yesterday that I thought was really interesting. So I just talked to a financial advisor. He has a client, zero exposure to Bitcoin. Okay. Right? And for years, right, since 2018, I've been using the hashtag get off zero. I'm like, I'm not saying 100% is the right number, but zero is the wrong number. Right. You got to have some exposure. <clears throat> he said he has zero, but he has six million in real estate. Interesting. Now let's just think about this for a second, right? He has that yeah. six million in real estate. Why? To protect his wealth from devaluation. Because again, the real estate doesn't grow. Like this building I'm sitting in doesn't grow. It doesn't get more efficient. It doesn't get better. It actually wears out. But the value goes up because the currency depreciates. Yes. So how much of that six million in real estate, when you think about, like I would show you around behind me, I mean, my, my office is empty. There's no one here. No one comes yeah. in anymore. Well, yeah. I don't need all this space. So in two years when my lease comes up, I'm Audi. And yeah. I, I love my office. And I don't want to give it up, but I just, it's, it's just wasted space. So if you've got investments in office real estate or uh, even industrial real estate, which has been in Fuego, some of it's not in the right spots anymore. And, and multifamily, there's massive supply coming on. So how much are you yeah. going to take of that real estate and say, you know, I might diversify into, into this Bitcoin thing? Yeah, well, I look at it as look. And we've had this conversation before, especially with the boomer generation. They built the greatest economy the world has ever seen. Don't tell me how to change and diversify when I've been working and using this system for generations. But yep. in a lot of ways, like you said, like there's a lot of people who might have 90% of their portfolio tied up in real estate. So why would you not diversify and look at the future and what the opportunity presents? But what is like the, the maximum supply of Bitcoin? Is it 21 million, if I'm correct? 21 so, million and yeah, 21 million. Yep. So 15, 16 million are basically saying I'm not selling. That's 75, 80%. So that begs the question, uh, if people are looking at this and have been following this space for such a long period of time and are nowhere near the point of saying I'm going to cash in, we don't know what the upside potential is, but what is the upside potential? Like you, you've kind of hinted in the past where this could go in years to come, but that, that's, that's a big nut, 75, 80% when people aren't selling making it extremely difficult for companies like BlackRock to actually purchase anything. Look, and, and this is this is the thing that people are going to have a hard time wrapping their head around. And it's actually why my Twitter handle has hashtag 2.1 quadrillion, yeah. because that's how many Satoshis <clears throat> exist in the world. So there are 100 million Satoshis per Bitcoin. So there's 2.1 quadrillion, which is 12 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. Okay. Now, a Bitcoin at a million dollars or $2 million or $5 million. I mean, literally, it's going to make people's head explode. They're, they're just, they're not going to be able to, to I can't afford that. Well, you don't have to buy a Bitcoin. You can yeah. buy one Satoshi, one right. 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. Of a Bitcoin, or you can buy 10 Satoshis or 100 Satoshis or 1,000. So what I, what I think needs to happen is at some point we need to flick a switch and we need to start talking about Satoshis. And there were some writings in, in these emails that came out you know, from uh, Satoshi Nakamoto himself that said the reason he picked the 21 million number is it kind of worked out to be global currency with a, a Satoshi equal to a dollar. And you know, that, that kind of yeah. kind of kind of works. And and ultimately, I think today a Satoshi is like, you know, 0.7 cents or something. I I, yeah. I I should be able to do that math, but I can't do it in my head. But over time, the idea that 
this thing is divisible to a hundred million units is going to catch on and people are going to understand. Like there's, I feel sorry for her. There's this, she's a very nice woman. She's a trader on Twitter. Uh, I won't name her name, but, but uh, she, she, she got in trouble. Um, actually, if you could, the, the, the picture behind me has a clue to her, her last name because Notre Dame something is, is her last name. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she made the comment that I don't get it because how can Bitcoin be scarce if it's divisible? And again, math is hard, right? I mean, it's yeah. like, well, no, no, there, there's a certain number of Bitcoin. And yes, each Bitcoin is divisible like pennies in a dollar. Having a hundred pennies in a dollar doesn't make the dollar easy. Go logic. Up. Yeah. But, but you know, she just she's made a mistake. And look, math, linear math is hard. Like if I say what's two times yeah. two, everybody listening would say four. If I say what's 17 times 23, I'll wait, right? That's the limit of human intelligence. The average person can't do 17 times 23 in their head. They need a calculator. Yeah. And some people can do it if they think long enough, but the the fact is linear math isn't that bad exponential math is really hard for the brain to grasp if i took 20 linear steps right 20 steps i would be at the other side of my office yep if i take 20 exponential steps i go around the world twice and people say that's bullshit. I'm like, just do the math. Do yeah, you know, two to the twentieth power, and and you get a big number. So, and- so so talking about so so talking about exponential. When we're talking about price appreciation right. in Bitcoin, if you're talking about the amount of sheer capital that institutions like Vanguard, BlackRock, are playing with, and you're talking about just automatic asset allocations in people's four hundred one ks to these ETFs. That's that's the number, that- and that's. That's back to, does that create a feedback loop yeah. that essentially deems the price of Bitcoin <clears throat> as an exponential as an exponential growth? Like, well, it is trajectory? exponential. If you look, if you look at its curve, it is exponential, yeah. right? And and that point, it's exponential in two ways. One, it makes these big parabolas, and then it crashes, yeah. and it makes another parabola. But what it also does, it makes a parabolic Metcalf's law curve, meaning Going from one dollar to ten dollars is a yeah. massive move, percentage-wise, right? Yes, ten times. Going from yeah. ten to twenty, that's another ten, but it's not that big a move. Yeah. So yeah. the law of large numbers starts to catch up. But here's here's the rub. Your point on how much money is coming in is really really important. And I made a comment the other day on Twitter that if I believe this year more fiat will be converted into Bitcoin, actual transaction, not paper, but actual transaction, than the history of Bitcoin. In the first 15 years, and I haven't done the math exactly and counted, but I think it's right around 300 billion. I think it's a little bit less than that. And And that's what? That's 1%? And and exactly. But uh, but the crazy part is, that's on a trillion two of market cap. So we have 1.2 trillion. Like, well, but but if it's 1.2 trillion, didn't 1.2 trillion come in? No, that's not the way it works, right? Because if I'm trying to put a dollar in and you have a dollar's worth of Bitcoin, yeah, you may say, you know what? I'm not selling it for a dollar. I'll sell it for a dollar twenty, I'll sell it for a dollar thirty, I'll sell it for a dollar forty. And so what happens is the people that came in early, right? They had to put a very small amount of money to get a huge amount of Bitcoin. In fact, some didn't have to put in any money because they mined it. And so as that then matures and people put new money in, then the amount of capital that converted to Bitcoin is a certain number. But then if you and I trade that same thing, we're not putting any new money in, right? You're so... It's yeah. it's called a multiplier. And so some people have estimated that the multiplier is like 100. I don't think it's that high. 
So like if if a dollar comes in, the price goes up a hundred a hundred dollars. Yeah, I don't think it's that high. I actually think it's it's a meaningful number. And so yeah, if you look at the last time we went from ten thousand to sixty thousand back in yeah. two thousand twenty, um, only ten billion came in. Think yeah. about that. The price quintupled or sextupled actually, sextupled. And we only brought in 10 billion into GBTC. No, this time we've already had more dollars. than 10 billion yeah. come in. And yeah. we went from 40 to 68. But, but why didn't we go up the same amount? Again, law of large numbers. But yeah. here's your point. How much is going to come in? I think this year, 300 billion, which again is more than all the money that's been converted yeah. in the past comes in. Well, where's that 300 billion number come from? Not just out of the sky. There's 30 trillion with a T. And that's, remember, 1 trillion is a dollar every second for 31,710 years. That's a lot. 30 trillion yeah. owned by us, boomers, controlled by our advisors, the UBS, yeah. the Merrill Lynch, the Vanguard, whatever. Okay. If those advisors say 1%, one percent, one that's 300 billion. Wow. So it's not 10%, it's not 50%, 1%, which is a reasonably logical number. 2% yeah. is better, 3% is better, but one is logical. Um, if 1% comes in, that's 300 billion. And that 300 billion, I think, will move the price materially more wow. than 300 billion. And, and, if, and, and then the problem comes that, FOMO kicks in. So if yeah. you think about the four year cycle, and we've talked about this in the past, the four year cycle is really easy. The price goes down in crypto winter because people are panicking and they're selling and they never really understood what they bought and they FOMO'd in at the top. And so they sell. And we have fair value and we get way below fair value. And the investors like to buy things below fair value. That, that's my job, right? That's what investors do. We buy things below fair value. So you start moving the price back to fair value right? And around having, you get to fair value. Well, then what happens? Well, the fair value increases. Because when the halving occurs, the number of block rewards gets cut in half. So if you think about it, the amount of money you're giving to the miners to secure the network gets cut yep. in half. Yeah. Their costs are fixed. So either half of them go out of business, or yep. the price adjusts, right? And magically, the last three times, last last four the times, price. the price adjusts. And it's totally yeah. logical. And it's mad genius that they program that into the code. So as that price rises, so now your price rises back toward fair value. Well, that price rise is pretty quick. So what happens? Humans, again, mostly guys, because we're hunter gatherers and we follow movement. We start coming in and we want to buy this stuff. And they panic, buy, and we shoot right past fair value. And so in the past, we get wow. to about 2.3 times fair value at the peak. So if you go back to 2017, 18, we went to 20,000 when the fair value was, was 10. Then last time we went to 68 when the fair value was 30. Now, why do we go so far above? Well, in those previous two cycles, we had lots of leverage, right? You yeah. could borrow a hundred, you know, 99 cents on a dollar to, you know, lever up. Some of the leverage is gone. There's still some, but most of it's gone. So I don't think this cycle will be as big. I mean, I could be wrong about that, but I don't think it'll be a, just as big. So let's say we get to one and a half times fair value. Okay. If fair value goes from 50 to a hundred, which I think it will, then you get a 50% increase above that. That's 150. But yeah. here's the problem. At 150, those advisors are going to be freaking out. And this yeah. is where my whole normalized thesis could just get blown out of the water. And we could have a parabolic move that, that will catch everybody off guard. And, you know, it could end up. Max Kaiser and others have been talking about this and 
You know, it's going to 200 or 300. Yeah. It's a low probability event, right? If you think about probability, you know, you have your, your tails and then you got your thing in the middle. So the, the more likely outcome is we end up well into six digits, 120, 150, somewhere in yeah. that range. That, that seems pretty darn logical. The tail event of, oh, we're going back to zero. Look, I, I was watching yes. this thing. No, no, no. I, I, no. Here's the thing. The only way this goes to zero is if, and it's capital I, capital F, but if the NSA or the CIA actually did He's create it. going to say, right? If, yes. If that's yeah. true, right? If they did create yeah. it and they control that big Nakamoto wallet, yeah. they could, right? Say at some point, all right, we got everybody to convert fiat into this. We took all the dirty fiat and we got the economy back and we're just going to sell the Nakamoto wallet and crush it back to the, that could happen. I don't think that's, I mean, it's a non-zero probability, but I think it's a little teeny tiny yeah. left tail event. The right tail event, right, which is people start FOMOing into this with more than 1%. And there are no Bitcoin to sell and BlackRock's got to buy it. Yeah. And we get a really big move. That's a non-zero probability too. Again, Mark, you see that happening? Do you see that happening? I, I, I definitely could see a lot of FOMO, but. I, 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 look, I, I think FOMO is a very powerful thing. I think the difference this cycle is the lack of leverage, right? You know, they clamp down on Binance. They clamp down, clamp down on BitMEX. Yeah, that's true. You, you're just, but but I also think it's a psycho. I also think it's the psychology because I mean we talk about Sats and we've talked about the overall price of Bitcoin. Yeah, that was a big psychological barrier. Like talking to people outside of finance or even outside of crypto, you go and tell them, yes, Bitcoin was at thirty thousand dollars. They're like, I can't afford that. I can't, can't buy a whole right. Bitcoin. Yep. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna partake. But if I can go on TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab and be buying shares. 30, 60, 100, even $1,000, that psychological barrier is gone. I mean, they're now, they're now just piling money into there. And oh, they yeah, can look, easily, I, and the I, amount of money that people have in the brokerage accounts vastly outstrips what they're willing to allocate to like a Coinbase. A hundred, a hundred percent. Even, even though they could buy a fraction of Bitcoin, Yes. That just doesn't no, register. Most of them don't know they can. But no, no, yeah. they don't know they can, to your point. But buying a $37 ETF all day. Yeah. All day. Yeah. And and this is just this is a little bit to your point about the financialization. You can get a margin loan and yes. and lever the ETFs. Yeah. Hmm. And yeah. Valkyrie, I think, some I can't I I can't remember who, somebody just filed a two times levered Bitcoin ETF. So those we're going to have the, levered those ETFs. The, those are on the so way. you think this is right? what these those ETFs have really, these ETFs have really done this really as, as much as we talk about mainstream and new users, what this announcement has really done is a now I'll allocate a lot of like new users into Bitcoin as you suggested, Anthony. And that's probably the accessibility. Yeah. It's sheer, sheer accessibility. And I mean, talking, talking about the broadening out of ETFs. I mean, Mark, I know you're involved in a lot more than just Bitcoin. Um, NFTs, Solana, Ethereum, the crypto, the crypto universe at large. I mean, do you think uh, there's a lot of speculation right now around an Ethereum ETF? I mean, do yeah, you think that that's I mean, like the next shoe to drop or the next thing delayed. on the horizon? Because the, yeah. the, the, the ETH catch up trade right now is what everybody's got their eyes on. I mean, I'm deploying capital right now into ETH. I have been for a while. And that seems like the obvious next shoe to drop. Um, as far as like mainstreaming crypto. For sure. And look, Bitcoin is digital gold. Okay. Yeah. It's just a better form of money. It's a way to be your own bank. It's unique. It wins. Everybody's like, whoa, what about, you know, Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin? Bitcoin wins. No. And it's called the law yeah. of increasing returns. It may not be the best tech. It doesn't matter. It got critical mass. It wins. That's the way it works. You know, Betamax versus VHS. Betamax lost. Better technology lost. So that's that. The world computer, Ethereum, 
internet computer. Some people like internet computer. Ethereum seems to have won to be the world computer. Yeah. And that's the thing that I've been shilling this, this book. Chris Dixon wrote a book called Read, Write, Own. Yeah. And it talks it's about great, it's a great web one, web yeah. two. And what people can't understand, blockchains are a form of computing. They are the next generation in computer. Everyone's like, no, AI is. No, no, no. AI is a tool that uses yeah. existing computing platforms and makes them self-propagating, kind of, because you can code them so they change things, like what just happened with Genesis uh, and, uh, and, and Google. I was That's reading wild. an article last crazy. night on actual AI hallucinations, which was some yeah, crazy so, shit. And um, so it's just a tool. Manipulating the model. But, yeah. but blockchains decentralized computing is yeah. the innovation from mainframe to microchip to personal computer to internet to mobile net to blockchains and so this this idea that there's going to be lots of blockchain adoption is real and you mentioned solana you know we made lots of money in solana we still own a little bit you know, there are people trying to convince me that, you know, lit, uh, chain link is the next big thing. And this goes back to yeah. what we talked about before in that, look, the internet has five protocols that matter. And we've talked yeah. about this. You got the base layer that we're using right now, TCP IP. And then you got Filecoin, I mean, uh, FTP to move files. You got HTTPS for websites, SMTP for email and www dot that ties it all together. There's a couple others, but it's basically those five. In the scenario that Web 3 looks like Web 1 and Web 2, do you have five protocols that matter? Bitcoin, Ethereum, Filecoin. Eh, it doesn't map exactly. So then, well, what if yeah. we have all these, these computers, these L1s, and then we have this bridging? And people are, uh, that's Chainlink, that's Chainlink. I'm like, okay. But prove to me that those yeah. links, those bridges are robust and not subject that's to attack you, vectors and losses. because that's, that's where the vulnerability, that's where that's the vulnerability, where the vulnerability lies in every protocol. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so until you tell me that that's fixed, I'm not going to go there. But that's that's mm -hmm. the second mental model. But then the one Bitcoin is the most secure computing network the yep. world has ever seen. Bar none. It's the best. So logically, it makes sense that every valuable asset, truly valuable, not like a JPEG that you don't care about, but something that's like this, the, the punk that sold yesterday for $16.5 million. Yeah. I'd probably want it on the most secure chain. Me personally, my, okay. man, nothing against ETH, yeah. but if I got something worth $16 million, I don't want a pointer to a cloud AWS server. That's a good point. I want it Correct. on chain. And so what you've seen, like I'm an on chain monkeys, they took the whole collection and inscribed it on Bitcoin. Yep. I like that. Now it's not worth $16 million, but at some point those high value assets, whether it's art collectibles title, I think goes to Bitcoin. Okay. So Bitcoin becomes the base layer. Well, but then we need L2s and L3s to do things with our Bitcoin, like borrow against it, lend it, do the, the you know, yeah. the future of DeFi. That's coming, maybe. DeFi, you know, right Bitcoin, it's better DeFi in Ethereum. Bitcoin's coming. It's better yeah. in Ethereum right now. It's better in, in Solana right now. Uh, you know, super cheap to send USDC on a Solana wallet compared to a ETH wallet. But that's one use case. If I could do the same thing for free, like sending it across the Bitcoin blockchain using the Strike yeah. app for free. Yeah, yeah but, but free is the wrong number, right? There has to be some motivation to have commerce. There needs to be an economic cost. There needs to be an economic cost yeah. for security. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well said. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. And so all of this is going to evolve. But... On top of all of this, is Ethereum going to outperform Bitcoin? The law of large numbers would say that yeah. it would, right? Mm. It's yeah. easier to go from 300 billion to 600 billion 
than it is from 1 trillion to 2 trillion. It just is, right? Just math. And so it's easier to go from 300 billion to a trillion, which is a 3x, versus 1 trillion to 2 trillion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then you go down even lower and say, well, what about something like an algo or a chain link or these things that are even smaller? Could they get to tens, if not hundreds of billions, and you make even more? Sure. And this is the cool yeah, part. Could. It's all about the tech. If you go back to the internet, all these great ideas were tried and failed. Webvan, mm -hmm. pets.com, you know, Digital Island, I mean, all these things. And then we had the crash and everybody's like, oh, the internet's busted, it'll never work. What do you look at all day, every day, the internet? Right. Right. And, and all those companies got reborn in the form of Amazon or Apple or Alibaba or whatever, and trillions yeah. of dollars of wealth were created. And so all yeah. of this application of blockchain technology is coming. And is it going to be one blockchain to rule all chains, just Bitcoin? Eh, probably not. I, I mean, I really don't think so. Yeah. I know the maxis think so, but prove it. Give me an L2 that works. Lightning doesn't really work. I mean, it works, but it's, yeah. it doesn't scale. Give me an L3. No one's showed me an L3 yet. So, and I always use it. I always describe it like, like money. I don't carry money. I literally don't have any money on me. I have a black yeah. card and just happens to be black. It's not, it's not like a, a black card, but I happen to, it's a, it's a master card. Yeah. Yeah, I have MasterCard. So it's black. And I I use it. And people accept it like money. But here's the crazy thing. It's literally a database on a COBOL mainframe. Yeah. Literally a database in a COBOL mainframe in a cloud somewhere. Okay, great. And once a month, I settle up through ACH. Okay. So that's an L3 through the L2. And then I settle down to the L1 fed wire that sits on top of the L0 gold. So I don't ever use the gold at, at Fort Knox. Right. But that's the base yeah. layer of the money that I transact in. Yeah. But I don't even use the money except once a month. Yeah. Because I can use this database system. And yeah. <clears throat> all all monetary transactions, people say, well, you're not going to use your Bitcoin to buy coffee. No, I'm going to use a credit card yeah. to buy coffee. And then I'm going to settle yeah, up leverage yeah. probably or leverage, but I'm not going to settle up to my savings account. Right. I'm going to settle up yeah. to my checking account. Oh, well, it's going to be called a checking account but it's to my liquidity account. But every once the simplest way to, to, to think about it, I would say is, is the buckets, right? At the bottom, you got your liquidity bucket. It's 10 to 15% of your, your assets is to fund your lifestyle. It has to be liquid. Yeah. It has yep. to be available. And you have to be able to spend it. Okay. 10 to 15%. Maybe it's a little more, a little, little but that's then at the tippy top, you got the get rich bucket. I would say that's you know 10 to 15% as well. And that's to do the friends condo deal, the brother-in-law's venture deal. You're going to yeah. lose all of it. So just keep it small. Yeah. That, you know, that, those yeah. are all the bad ideas, but, but everyone's going to do them. And then you got your stay rich bucket. The stay rich bucket is where you diversify and you have a portfolio. Now, could that be a lot of Bitcoin? Cause that's your savings technology. Sure. Could it be yeah. real estate? Could it be, you know, stocks? Could it be sure? But ultimately that's, gonna you know your your get rich bucket is going to drip down into that and keep that whole and then once a year you replenish your liquidity bucket to do your spending and so the idea that that people aren't going to embrace and adopt this better savings technology which is all bitcoin really yeah. is it's just kind of silly at this point and peter schiff you know god love the guy when, usually when you're I was wrong, actually just about to, I was I mean, actually just about to wrong, ask you about saying, you know what? I made a mistake. I was wrong. Happens all the time. Yeah. But this guy, no way. He is doubling. I think he and enjoys down. 
I, I think, I, I think he enjoys the engagement farming. No, no, uh, and it's, it's for sure an act. That's it. It's it's for sure an act. P- it, Peter Schiff is a act. showman. I've actually met Peter Schiff. I met Peter Schiff a couple times um, in person at a couple of like uh, conferences. Peter Schiff is a showman through and yeah. through. Very intelligent guy, but you can tell on his tweets that is engagement farming and that is a show now to yeah. get the Bitcoin maxis feathers ruffled. And yeah. I mean, speaking of Peter Schiff and speaking of gold, I mean, I'm a proponent of gold. I, I like gold. I, I still have some of it. I probably always will. Do you think that Bitcoin has fun now has fundamentally altered the demand for gold oh, for with, sure. these, with, with, with these ETFs? A hundred percent. Look, gold made a new all time high yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. All time. Not not like, you know, 15 years all time, like 5000 year all time. So it made a new high yeah. in dollars and no one cared. I mean, literally no, no one cared. That's and actually a if good If you point. look at the chart of inflows into Bitcoin ETFs, outflows from gold ETFs, yeah. like literally outflows, forget just less inflows, actual outflows. So there's definitely people who are saying, you know, gold, I, I get it. And look, having physical gold bars or coins, there's some logic, right? In the Mad Max world. It's a great feeling to have that tangibility. Yeah. But, um, but there's a yeah. scenario. You know, we've all heard the stories of the woman who bribed her way out of, you know, Nazi Germany with her earrings. Okay. There, there are plenty of examples of where a physical good could, could be an asset. Yeah. Fine. But here's the problem. Gold is really difficult to store. It's heavy. Yeah. It's big. It does, you know, it's dangerous to have it in your house because people can come steal it. So you yeah. got to have a place to store it. That's right. expensive. The other problem is, whereas a, a Bitcoin is divisible into 100, 000, 100 million units, Satoshis, a bar of gold, even if I could take this bar of gold and yeah. break it in half, which I'm not strong enough to do, but even if I could, I couldn't stuff it in the computer and send it to you guys. Exactly. I can tap my phone and send you Bitcoin instantaneously. And that my, my, my visibility like my policy. and yeah. portability are in a piece of, well, what if the internet's down? Come like, on. Well, if the global internet is down for a meaningful period of time, we are not going to be caring about our money. We're going to be caring exactly. about food yeah. and medicine. Yeah. yeah. Don't, uh, yeah, don't give me the Mad Max. And even in that scenario, technically, you could transact using, you know, telephone, telegraph, you know, yeah. paper. You know, you can, you can trade seed phrases on paper, but, yeah. and you keep them in your brain. They don't even have to be on the internet. But, but all that said, it doesn't matter. There's going to be some role for gold. I think it is diminishing. And here's yeah. what's going to happen. Central banks and maybe they already have, are going to start adding Bitcoin. And that means they'll need a little bit less gold or a little bit less dollars, or a little bit less renminbi. Yeah. And why are they going to do that? Well, because if they don't, they're going to run the risk of people abandoning yes. their currency. Yeah, right? that's a very good point. That's a very and good point. Every central bank wants to stay relevant. Of course. Every yeah. nation state wants to stay relevant. And, you know, and this is where we can get really, think about nation states. Yeah. Just think about them for a second. It's literally, and I don't, I don't mean this in a racist way, but it's a bunch of white guys, because it was mostly white guys, sitting in a room, drawing lines on maps and saying, this is yours, this is mine. Yeah. That's yeah. probably not the best allocation of global resources I've ever seen. No. And it was no, enforced with violence, right? Wars and ships and navies and and borders were carved out and deals were done. And, you know, and they got people saying, you know, Russia saying we want Alaska back. I, I don't know. I mean, you could yeah. buy it back, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. Right. And yeah. but 
whatever. So, but this, this idea of nation states is kind of a funky thing in a world where I will argue that the threat of kinetic war is lower. And people say, but there's wars all the time. Very no, no not really. Proxy wars that are created by the defense industry to sell missiles and like I correct. I they're, skirmish, they're skirmishes. They're not they're, they're not skirmishes. Wars. They're skirmishes. And, yeah. and look, that does not diminish the loss of life and the disruption. Oh no, not at all. But it's but it's it's bad people doing bad stuff. And, yeah. and my my favorite example, and this is not a, a slam against him, but when Trump took office, I think in his fourth day. Remember, he shot 200 Tomahawk missiles into Syria yes. and hit nothing. Yeah. Like, Correct. It was like, a show of force. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean you hit nothing? Like, like literally hit yeah. nothing? I mean, you just blew up 200 missiles just for threat of violence, but yeah. also to make Raytheon a lot of money. And so Correct. in a world where that's kind of what war is, it's not like, you know, the old Napoleon versus, you know, the world days. Yeah. Uh, great movie, right? Um, the difference is now the war is cyber. It's about Correct. chip superiority and it's about electronic yeah. superiority. In that world, nation states have a different look and feel. And, you know, Balaji wrote his book about it. You know, the, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's about the, you know, the nation stateless world. Yep. And, yeah. It's a generational so anyway. thing. What's normal for a 15 or 20 year old? Be better, they won't know it. We'd be better off. Well, that's, that's my favorite little thing. It's just, you know, I have a, uh, three grandkids and my youngest is, is one. So she's a Zoomer, yeah. right? She's a Gen A and maybe all three are, but I know for sure that the last one is. And I say, she will never have a leather wallet no. ever, right? She'll never use paper. The only money. reason, the only reason I carry mine right now is because my driver's license is in it. Right. If you but took, eventually if you that's going to be Joe license, Rogan. Yeah, you, you digitize and tokenize my driver's license I've, and my insurance cards. I have no need for my wallet. Whatsoever. Joe Rogan on a recent podcast was talking about 100 years ago, pivoting from horse and buggy to car. And now we're on the verge of 100 years later from going to, you know, cars to like self-driving cars where yeah. I think that generation will never know what it feels like to grab yeah. onto a steering wheel. And uh, no, no, exactly. Cars. And. And it's funny because I'm on the eve of, of having to go to court. I, I got a speeding ticket here in, in Chapel Hill because um, I was speeding. Um, mostly because I just didn't know the speed limit because it's on this big road that should be 45, but it's 35, but whatever. So, but I didn't have my license. I forgot it. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to get a ticket for not having my license. And I said, I don't have my license. And he says, oh, you got your, your, uh, your registration card? I'm like, yeah. He says, oh, I can get it off the system. Didn't bust me. Didn't give me any <laughs> shit. I'm like, oh my god. Now yeah. I will. I will still carry my license, but but even then I didn't have to because it was on the system. And um, anyway, I thought that was interesting because I well, always thought that was another ticket I'll, that I was going to get. I'll leave you this. Yeah. With I've got that. I've gotten that ticket too. Of course, the last speeding ticket I got as well. I didn't have my driving li driver's license with me. Well, you talked yeah. about gold hitting an all-time high and really no one must talk about it yesterday, but perception is reality and timing is everything. And on Twitter yesterday, I saw over 8,000 votes and over 95% of people. If you had to pick between one or the other, gold or Bitcoin here in 2024, you could imagine what the 95% were picking. It was Bitcoin. And that yeah. is just the reality as to like what we're in. But when you add up all these things and the psychological thing that you touch on, Anthony, and how it complements today's lifestyle and moving forward, you can understand where we're headed and well uh, it's it's the digital divide and and you know I'm, I'm, I'm probably told you this already but i use this all the time right if you ask anyone over 35 and i you know i'm in that camp right so ask them who's your broker oh ubs merrill lynch why right how much gold do you have i don't know three four percent how much bitcoin do you have well zero there's a yeah. ponzi scheme haven't you heard that peter schiff guy how often do you use DeFi? what's DeFi? yeah, yeah. Ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? What's a broker? broker. Yeah. I mean, I got a yeah. Robinhood account, but what's a broker? How much gold do you have? Oh my God, Boomer Rocks, zero. Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Because it's like a really big percentage. I'm kind of embarrassed. Yeah. I often use DeFi every day. Yeah. That digital divide is real. 
and $37 trillion, big number, is coming from my generation, That's us boomers, to our kids. And and it's it's happening, right? As much as I yeah. would love to live forever, it ain't gonna happen. One percent and, you know, you I got lots of years left. That's a but, lot of money. One percent of that thirty trillion in this year alone. But you can understand this. My, 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 my parents were just here this weekend and they're like, Well, you're getting X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, guys, you're 70. You got plenty of time I left. Know, exactly. I don't need to know. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and and look, you know, it's like they're looking forward to get rid of it almost. Yeah, I know. Um, it's like to like pass it down. You know what's a good business it, to be in right now? People that own storage containers because no generation wants all these antiques and furniture. It's just like, what do you do with all this stuff? And that's what previous generation. Well, and, and to that point, my parents not only have one, they have two. And my wife's already said, match. We're, we're, we're lighting it all on fire. So what are they, they anyway. think of the money that they were like, when we downsized, uh, we left, uh, the Toronto came to our cottage, lived in our cottage for a couple of years. So I had all this furniture from our house in Toronto. And I think I was spending $450 a month, but man, there were That's units right. as far as the human eye could see. And I'm thinking this is a good self storage, self storage REITs are a booming. Business. I bet. Oh yeah. They do very, very well. And yeah. then private equity comes and platforms them and does their whole thing. It's a fantastic yeah. business. Mark, it's always no, great catching right. up with you. Please. No, keep no, you guys, this, this is so much fun. It's, it's always amazing to me how fast we can make an hour seem. I know. Um, but well, enjoy the conversation every time and we look forward to doing it again. Yes. Good talk, Definitely okay? look forward to doing it soon. Hopefully at a new all time. Yes. Good point. In, the, uh, in, in Bitcoin. Thanks, right. Mark. Be well, guys. Thanks, Mark. Talk soon. Hey everyone, so how are you surviving these tough market conditions right now? Are there any emerging industries that you want us to cover? Any guests that you want us to interview? Then leave a comment below and let us know who you want us to source out. As usual, share this video with your network, smash that like and notification bell, and as usual, and most importantly, subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.